Hi everyone. Today we'd like to summarize the ideas behind significance testing and introduce you to the tools we can use to carry out such tests. We're not going to give you all the details, but we hope we provide enough to make the process a little more clear. The process begins with a question about a larger population. We'll consider the population of all M&Ms. It is not a very important or interesting population, but it's familiar and easy to talk about, so it won't really distract us from the main ideas. On the other hand, it does fit the bill for the kinds of populations that we consider in this course. It's very large, it's spread out all over the world, and it's literally impossible for us to observe every single one. The question we'd like to ask about it is, what percent of all M&Ms are blue? But in fact, we will, for reasons that will become clear later, ask a modified version of this question, the one that you see here. Could the percentage of all M&Ms that are blue be 20%? We will translate this into what we might call a working hypothesis. It will sound a little strange because we state a hypothesis as if it is true, even though we don't know whether it is or not. Here's the hypothesis. 20% of all M&Ms are blue. So here's how the reasoning is going to work. The evidence we use will be from a real random sample of M&Ms. Then we will reason that there are two possibilities. If the sample's proportion is close enough to 20%, then we will infer that the population's proportion of blue M&Ms could also be 20%, that is, that the hypothesis could be true. We won't know for sure, but at least the evidence from our sample will not have contradicted the hypothesis. On the other hand, if the sample proportion is not close to 20%, then we'll reject the hypothesis since it is likely to be false. After all, a hypothesis that cannot predict actual facts is not really a very good hypothesis and so deserves to be rejected. The trouble we have here is that in dealing with a random sample, we can't really trust our intuition about what it means for a sample proportion to be close to 20% or far away from 20%. After all, what does close to 20% really mean? Is 25% close? Or 30%? Or 40%? Or are these far enough away from 20%? we need a way to decide. Just as when working with random events in probability, we need many, many simulations to help us learn what to expect. Then we will know what kinds of samples are typical and what are unusual, and we'll be able to judge whether or not to be surprised by a particular sample, our sample. The tool we will use is called a sampling distribution. We want to show you how this works. Before we begin, we want to record some information about the actual sample of M&Ms that we're going to use. The sample size was 564. This is because it's the exact number of M&Ms that we got our hands on for our sample. We also counted the number of blue ones and computed the sample proportion to be 0.223 by dividing the 126 blues by the total of 564. Notice that we record this as a proportion and not as a percent, but that doesn't stop us from thinking of it as 22.3% of our sample was blue. We head to a software site called StatKey that you can access from the Moodle page in our course, and we're going to open the application for a sampling distribution for a proportion. So here's how the software works. First I have to edit the proportion and record the hypothesized value that we are testing, in this case 20%. I've also got to set the sample size so that the software knows to simulate samples of 564 M&Ms at a time. When I push the button to generate one sample, the computer creates a simulated sample of 564 randomly selected M&Ms, figures out the proportion that are blue, records this proportion as a dot on the number line, and also shows us what the proportion in that sample was. In this case, it was 0.207. We can do this again, and again, and again, and each time StatKey records the simulated sample's proportion of blue M&Ms and shows us the proportions on the right. Each time that I push that button, the computer draws a single simulated sample. The fact that each sample can have a different proportion of blue M&Ms is a result of the randomness, and we refer to this as sampling variability. The job of the sampling distribution is to show us how sampling variability ought to behave in this situation. Again, notice that each dot represents one simulated sample's proportion of blue M&Ms. 
the software records these as dots so that we can see them all at once. I hope this reminds you of the simulations we did to estimate probabilities in a previous class. Each individual sample's proportion is unpredictable, but we do expect there to be some sort of regularity in the long run. We'll need several thousand simulations to see what this might be, so we click the Generate 1000 Samples button until we have at least 5,000 samples total. Now we see what kinds of samples to expect. Almost all of them are between 16% and 24%, with a few outside of this range. Also, we never got one below 15%, and we never got one above 24%. This might already defy your intuition, though it seems like any kind of sample is possible when generating 564 M&Ms at random. Some samples are just not going to happen. For example, would you ever expect a sample to have all blue or no blue at all? Of course you wouldn't. The sampling distribution tells us that we should rule out lots of other possibilities too. The sampling distribution has some helpful features for us. If we check the two-tail box, then some numbers appear. The numbers on the bottom of the graph are sample proportions. The numbers above the dots are probabilities. For example, here's how you read this. If the hypothesis about 20% blue in the population is correct, then there is a 95% probability that a sample will have between 16.7% and 23.4% blue. These are the black dots. Likewise, there is a 2.5% probability that there will be fewer than 16.7% blue in the sample. These are the red dots highlighted on the left. And there's also a 2.5% probability that a sample will result in a proportion of blue dots, sorry, blue M&Ms, that's greater than 23.4%. These are the dots highlighted in red on the right. The software highlights these dots for us so that we can apply the unusual event guideline. Remember this guideline is that anytime the probability of a random event is below 5%, then the event is unusual. In our case, a sample proportion would be unusual if it's far enough away from 20%, meaning below 16.7 or above 0.234. That's why there's 2.5% on each side so that the total for the extremes is 5%. The next step is to get specific information about our sample, which had 22.3% blue M&Ms. We can already see that it's not unusual since it falls in the middle 95% and not in the extreme 5%, but we want to make the evidence a little bit more clear and show how strong it is. So our sample proportion is 22.3%. Since this is bigger than the 20% in the center, we're going to enter it into the bubble on the right of the distribution. So I click on this and enter the 0 0.223. Now the software highlights all of the simulated samples that are at least as far away from 20% as ours is. It does this for the extreme samples both on the right and the ones who are at least as far away, but on the left. In this way, we can now add the two outside probabilities, 0 0.088 plus 0 0.088, to say something like this. The probability of a sample like ours is about 0.176. That is, the probability of a sample having at least as many blue M&Ms as ours does is about 0 0.176. This number is called the p-value, and we write p equals 0.176. The p stands for probability, and we have learned that our sample is not an unusual event at all. If the hypothesis of 20% blue for the population is true, then our sample's probability is high enough, that is larger than 5%, that we say we will not reject the original hypothesis. In technical language, we say the difference between the sample proportion and the hypothesized proportion is not statistically significant. So we have used the evidence from our sample of M&Ms to make the best inference about the population. Returning to the sampling distribution for a moment, we see that it would have taken a sample proportion that was smaller than 16.7 or larger than 23.4 for us to have rejected our hypothesis of 20% blue. Since that didn't happen, we can also say that the evidence against this hypothesis was not strong enough to reject it. Of course, the goal for the future is to learn how to apply this kind of test in many scientific settings. For that, stay tuned. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know.